where that sidewalk is right there? That's where my house used to be. That's where I live. My name is Francis O'Hearn, and uh, I live in Colmont now, the former of Centralia, born and raised there until the time of the mine fire, and then we had to move out. My name is Tom Hanoski. I was born and raised in Centralia here. Yes, I grew up and lived here my whole life. When the mine fire started, the population here was about 1,170. But they tell me years ago in the heydays, in the 30s and 40s, there was like 3,000 here. 3,000 people lived there. It was uh, a regular mining town. Everybody more or less got along together and everything. Very tight knit. Didn't matter what anybody was, what religion you were, what political affiliation you were, what I mean. This is the only town, I, and I tell people this all the time, if somebody died on their street, the, the older people from that street went around and took a collection up and got flowers and stuff from the people. And I, I, never, and I tell people that, and they look at me like, what? Just, that's the truth. That's, that's, everybody did it in the town like that. Whoever was the oldest ones on that street, and as they passed away, the next oldest ones took over. They were in charge. Baseball, football, roller skating, we had that all in town. Made a lot of fun. All the kids got along together and everything. We were really had good times. And when we were kids here, like down on our block, we'd all be here playing. My neighbor across the street, Mrs. Brennan, she, she hollered at me as much as my mom did. You know what I mean? You do that today to kids, oh, I'm getting a cop. I mean, was, that's the way it was. Joni, jump at Joni's. There'd be 50 of us playing at their house. Really, it was fun living here. My recollection is that it uh, started in a, a strip and pit where they had the dump and uh, it caught on fire there and that they had called the fire company and the fire company came and put hoses up there but to no avail, it didn't put out the fire, it progressed from there and it, when the state did come in and everything, they claimed they didn't have any more money, but it could have been put on in another week. The fire actually, they said, started like in the early 60s, so I was only real little then. But I remember like a lot of the work they were doing on it, and you know, as I got to be a teenager, they were drilling and trying to excavate it, but it all, they always were a dollar short and, a, and two days late, like, you know, never could come up with that extra buck just to extinguish it, probably because they didn't want to extinguish it. When you watched them just digging out the fire, it was pathetic, you know, <laughs> and that, and they'd catch up to it, and then they'd shut down for a couple of days, and all the old miners would say, well, don't let the methane exposed, cover it, cover it, because it's getting the air, it's going to burn faster, and that's what, more or less what they wanted, we always said. They numerous things they tried here. Fly ash was one of the big ones. They tried concrete down in the holes. They tried sand down in the holes. But uh, they never tried the realistic thing of trying putting water down in the holes. You know, what out is fire is water. Well, the, the gas started coming into our home and they, our boys were small then and they gave us two weeks to get out. We had to find a home, then they gave us an extension. We more or less didn't want to leave, but the government more or less forced you. And uh, we're no lover of government. <laughs> it's 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 a situation of, okay, you're, you're living in Mount Carmel and you get a job in Wilkesbury, well, you have to move to Wilkesbury. It's a different situation when the government comes here and tells you we're taking your house off you. I mean, that's, it's not right. It's not right. And then, 
After that, it was contract after contract, flushing the streets with fly ash, and there were so many contracts given out, and all of us was big government, you know. You know, it broke a lot of friendships up because this this one wanted to stay and that one wanted to go and, you know, it just caused a lot of hard feelings there for her. Meetings would really get heated and, that, and that's when people started turning into people. And it was, you know, pathetic. No, that, that's when this program started, the first people that left from on the hill up there, like on Wood Street, like up where the Oddfellow Cemetery is, there was houses up in the back there. Those people got hardly anything. And as they, the government saw they weren't getting the people out, this, the rules to this project changed monthly. You know what I mean? It, it, the, the longer you stayed, the, the more you were getting, the more money you were getting. They were giving you anything to try and get you out. But the, these people knew how to do it. This, this scam here that they were running, they had the, this town was a lot of big, like, long blocks. So they'd buy a couple houses in the middle, give the people good offers. Well, once the middle of the block got all, you know, the house was empty, it was sitting abandoned there for a couple of years, the rest of the people got disgusted and half of them moved too. I, if it would have been a lot more single homes or just doubles, you know, half a doubles, two houses, I bet you a lot more people would have stuck it out here. Well, they'd, they'd come knocking at your door and uh, the one lady, she came and she sat down at the table with us and talking and everything. And then she went over and says, to our neighbor that we took the offer. Never even discussed an offer. And, uh, and then she came over and she said, we're, we thought we were all going to be together when we talked to them. We didn't say nothing to them. We, they just asked this question, but you took their offer. What offer? They didn't even make an offer. We're a law-abiding citizen. I don't, we don't bother anybody. Don't ask any for any, you know, we'll help anybody. But when it comes to the government, forget it. I mean, they are corrupt as corrupt could be. That's the whole problem here. I mean, I, I tell them anywhere. I'll put a go on ABC News and tell them that the problem was never heard of money fire. And right here it is. Right here is proof. This is the kind of corruption that's been going on from day one. I guess they thought we were a bunch of hillbillies and never, nobody will ever find out about it. Nobody will ever know anything. And it, it, it's the government put out a report in 83, GAI consultants from Pittsburgh did a report for the Bureau of Mines. The fire, and it was, it's right in the port, the, the fire could have never came down and came up this side of the town because of the water table here. The veins come down this mountain, go underneath and come back up. I know a lot about them because I'm in the coal mining business since I, for, since I was a little kid. And it's a natural water table. The water could, the fire could have never come down or past Main Street. So up in that corner of the town, yeah, some people might have had to move from Three quarters of the town could have never been affected by the fire and never would be affected by the fire. Just take my mom, for instance, in the same house, you know, for 86 years. I said years ago, what, did you ever do a survey on how many people died from broken hearts from leaving her? Without a doubt, it killed a lot of the older people. They would be only gone six, eight months. You'd read the paper, they're dead. They were perfectly healthy when they were here. I mean, it's...
And the only reason it's slowed down a little bit now, because being in the coal mining business like I am my whole life, the coal market is really dead right now, so it laid off a little bit. Three, four years ago, the coal market was booming and there was a real push on to get everybody out of here. There's probably 15 people left. Most of them are my family. <laughs> and we're a real thorn in their side for them, you know, being here. There probably is five, six billion dollars worth of coal here, not million, billions. So you could see, you know, I mean, what they're after. They're not after pennies here. I think if it is right now, the people that are left here, it's not even a matter of money. Nobody wants one cent, not one penny does anybody want. They just want to be left alone. That's not asking for a lot in this world today where everybody's asking for everything for free. People can come back and say, you'd like to work on one. I, I used to live there. We can't, there's nothing there. But it was, like we said, it was a good town. Like most of the towns around here. They're close to and everything like that. And, and I'm, you know, I, I talked to lots and lots of friends that I have, and you know, they tell me they would move back here in one second if they had the opportunity.